Good afternoon. I'm Mark Updegrove, the director of the LBJ Library, and I'm pleased to welcome you here today. We are honored to have as our guest the 12th Secretary General of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, His Excellency Anders Foe Rasmussen. Secretary General Rasmussen took his position at NATO in August 2009. He brought with him extensive experience in politics, government, and foreign affairs. In 1978, after graduating university, he was elected as a member of the Danish parliament representing the Liberal Party. He rose through his party's ranks through the years to become Prime Minister of Denmark in 2001, a post he held for eight years, and which included a term as President of the European Union in 2002. The Secretary General leads NATO at a time when freedom is in question in the Middle East, with uprisings in Libya and Syria, ongoing challenges in Afghanistan, and despite the recent death of Osama bin Laden, the continued threat of terrorism throughout the world. The Secretary General will touch on these issues in his address, NATO, Defending Freedom in the 21st Century. After his remarks, he and I will adjourn to this stage where he will take some of your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming His Excellency Anders Foe Rasmussen. Mr. Optogrove, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for that warm uh, Texas welcome. Um, it is indeed um, a, a great pleasure uh, to be uh, in, in Austin. Um, it's always a great pleasure to, to visit uh, Texas. I've been here on several occasions last time, uh, three years ago, I did a wild mountain bike ride um, at Crawford with the then President Bush. Um, it's always a pleasure to visit the United States. Um, I am uh, born and raised in Denmark in a family um, that highly values the United States um, and what this uh, great country uh, stands for. We all know that there are strong political bonds between Europe and the United States. There are strong economic ties. But I think there is a bond that is even stronger. And that's the personal bond between people and families uh, on both sides uh, of uh, the Atlantic. And um, we shouldn't underestimate the strength of these personal bonds. Um, let me just illustrate that strength by telling you a little story about two young people who grew up on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, the American girl, Christina, who grew up in the state of uh, Minnesota. Uh, when she was 12, uh, in her geography class, her teacher asked the students to write essays uh, on um, different countries across the world. And to make the whole exercise a bit more exciting, uh, he uh, would not allow uh, the students to, and uh, to pick and choose the countries themselves. So he organized a kind of a lottery. Uh, in a hat, he put small paper notes uh, with uh, specific uh, country names and asked the students to pick up um, these uh, uh, paper notes and pick up uh, names of specific countries. And this girl, Christina, uh, she picked up Denmark, my home country, and she started to study Denmark, and she got very interested in everything about uh, 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 Denmark. Uh, and um, uh, later, 
uh, she uh, uh, went to college in Virginia uh, at the Randolph Macon Women's College uh, in Virginia, and she brought with her her strong interest in everything about uh, Denmark. On the other side, thousands of miles uh, away from Minnesota, a Danish boy, Henrik, our son, uh, grew up very interested in everything uh, about uh, Denmark. As a son of a Danish politician, uh, he often felt a bit uh, challenged, um, and he, he dreamt about uh, the United States. And um, one day, after having served in the Danish military, he declared in the best American Western style that this town is too small for the two of us. Um, so uh, he left Denmark, uh, went to Hampton Sydney College in Virginia, by the way, neighboring the women's college. One day I was invited in my capacity as Danish Prime Minister to address the students at Hampton Sydney College, where my, uh, our son Henrik enjoyed his life. I addressed the students, and um, Christina uh, saw the announcement that the Danish Prime Minister was going to address the students at Hampton Sydney College, and as she was very interested in everything about Denmark, she decided to go to Hampton Sydney College to listen to the Danish Prime Minister. She was seated next to Henrik. Um, she didn't know Henrik, even less that he was the son of the Danish uh, Prime Minister. I don't know how much the young couple remember from the Prime Minister's speech. Um, but eventually they got engaged. Later they got married. Um, Henrik became Danish citizen. They have settled here in the United States. And in January they got twins. So my wife and I are now the proud grandparents of two lovely American citizens. <laughs> so you can understand that for me, the transatlantic bond is something very strong personal. Um, and I am particularly pleased uh, to be able to, to speak here uh, at, at the library. Uh, dedicated uh, to uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, who did so much to strengthen liberty, democracy, and justice uh, in this great uh, nation. Um, when he extended the right to vote to millions of Americans, Lyndon B. Johnson followed in the transition uh, of uh, many great Americans uh, who had gone before him. Uh, from the founding fathers who pioneered the Declaration of Independence uh, and the Bill of Rights, to Rudolf Wilson with his vision uh, for a peaceful uh, international order. And from Franklin Roosevelt, who understood that the liberty of the few at the expense of the many was never a solid basis for a nation to prosper. To Martin Luther King, who fought for the freedom of all Americans, regardless of their race. So it's a great honor for me, not only to be here, but to be able to talk to you. Uh, and uh, I would like to focus my remarks on three things. First, the fundamental desire to be free. Second, NATO's role in safeguarding uh, our freedom. And third, why the United States and Europe must work together to carry forward the flame of freedom. So let me first talk about freedom. Just over a week ago, President Obama informed the American people about the successful operation uh, against Osama bin Laden. The evil vision of bin Laden was 
diametrically opposed to the values of the United States and its NATO allies. An evil vision whose bankruptcy is becoming increasingly clear. Two days ago, I had the great honor to take part in the commemor commemoration of uh, victory in Europe Day uh, at the National World War II Memorial uh, in uh, Washington. It was a moving ceremony which brought home that we have encountered evil visions before, not that long ago. Evil visions which ultimately did not withstand the flame of freedom. In the Second World War, the flame of freedom prevailed over fascism and tyranny. And soon after the conflict, we were successful uh, in um, turning former adversaries into responsible democracies with the help of organizations like the United Nations, the European Union, and NATO. NATO was successful again in standing up to communist dictatorship. The alliance first prevented the Cold War from getting hot. It then extended the hand of partnership and cooperation to its former Cold War rivals. And many of those countries are now not only thriving democracies, but also members of NATO making their contribution to our common security. In the past few months, we have also seen people across North Africa and the Middle East defeat fear and embrace freedom. It has been a powerful reminder that the fundamental desire to be free resides in all of us. Freedom is not just a Western value. It is a universal value. It's not a commodity for the few, but one that is valuable only if it is shared by the many. And there is no choice between security and freedom. The only possibility is to embrace both. And this brings me to my second point, NATO's role in safeguarding our freedom. In our NATO alliance, nearly a billion people share not only the same values of freedom, democracy, and humanity, they also share the capabilities to safeguard those values. And that is important because values without real commitment can quickly become hot air. And capability without shared values will lack vision and purpose. Our engagement in Afghanistan clearly demonstrates NATO's determination and ability to safeguard our values. Under the clear United Nations mandate, we are protecting our security by helping the Afghans to take responsibility for theirs. The United States plays a key role, but the United States is not alone. Over 40,000 troops from allied and partner nations are fighting shoulder to shoulder with American forces. Over the course of the past year, we have taken the fight to the Taliban. We are training and educating ever more Afghan soldiers and policemen. And the Afghan security forces are playing an increasingly important role in combat operations and in solidifying the security gains. The Taliban attack in Kandahar a few days ago was planned as a 
spectacular assault. But it wound up being a spectacular failure. Not least because of the contribution of the Afghan forces, um, which are becoming increasingly capable to provide security for their own country. We have now entered a new and significant phase in our Afghanistan mission. As we gradually transition lead security responsibility to the Afghans themselves. The transition process is on track. Together with our Afghan partners, we aim to complete it by 2014. But we remain committed to supporting Afghanistan well beyond through an enduring partnership. Our engagement uh, in Afghanistan demonstrates the importance of Europeans, Canadians and Americans working together for success. We are well aware that a secure and stable Afghanistan means a safer world for all of us. We will continue our mission to ensure that Afghanistan does not return to being a sanctuary for terrorists and extremists. We have the right strategy, the right resources, and we have the resolve to see this through. Finally, my third point, why America and Europe must continue to work together to carry forward the flame of freedom. Brave people, throughout the Arab world have cried out for the freedom that America and Europe have enjoyed for many decades, thanks to NATO. Change is taking hold in many places in North Africa and the Middle East. But Libya is an exception. Colonel Gaddafi and his regime are brutally repressing their people who have expressed the desire for freedom. In March, NATO allies took command of all military operations in Libya to protect civilians against Colonel Gaddafi's relentless attacks. Acting with the authority of an historic UN Security Council resolution. Gaddafi may remain defiant, but for his regime, time is up. We are flying a thousand sorties per week and steadily degrading his war machine. His strategy to retake the country by force has failed and his international isolation is growing by the day. Just like Afghanistan, Libya is a strong demonstration of NATO's resolve. But it is also another demonstration that solidarity in NATO is a real two-way street. Over 7,000 troops more than 200 aircraft and 20 ships are engaged in our Operation Unified Protector. All those 20 ships are contributed by Canada and European allies. And a majority of the aircraft come from allies and NATO partners, including from the region. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2012, President Obama will host the next NATO summit here in the United States. It will be a great opportunity for all 28 NATO allies to reaffirm their commitment to protecting each other's security and common values. President Kennedy once remarked 
that the cost of freedom is always high, but Americans have always paid it. NATO allies owe a great debt of gratitude to America for being prepared to pay this cost. I hope today I have reassured you that we neither want nor expect the United States to walk this path alone. There is a strong understanding throughout the NATO alliance of the fundamental need to share this burden with the United States. And we all know that the cost of freedom is worth paying. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those remarks, Mr. Secretary General. And uh, I would invite members of our audience to, uh, to ask brief questions of the Secretary General. And I'll begin with my own, if I may. Uh, the, the news that uh, Osama bin Laden had been uh, killed by American forces was, I think, a, a, a great boon for freedom throughout the world. Can you tell us uh, how you heard of the news and what you think it does uh, for our future? Um, yeah, I heard the news um, very early morning European time uh, and uh, immediately uh, we issued a statement of con congratulation uh, to uh, President Obama and all those uh, involved. Um, it's my very firm belief uh, that this major blow uh, to international terrorism uh, will also have a positive uh, impact uh, on um, uh, our operation uh, in Afghanistan. First of all, I would like to stress that we stay the course uh, in Afghanistan because we should also realize that while Osama bin Laden himself does not pose a threat to international security any longer. Uh, his terror network still exists. Other terror networks are still operating. Um, so international terrorism still poses a threat to our security. Uh, so we will continue our operation um, with the aim to ensure that Afghanistan will not once again become a safe haven for terrorists that could use Afghanistan as a launching pad for their attacks against the United States or uh, Europe. Having said that, I still think there may be a positive uh, impact because it's now demonstrated very clearly that extremism has no future. And I have a very clear message to the Taliban uh, in uh, Afghanistan. Continued fighting will lead to Taliban defeat. You are now at a crossroads. Cut off links with Al-Qaeda and uh, other terror networks. Renounce violence. Engage in a political process. Participate in the rebuilding uh, of uh, your society. So I hope that a successful operation uh, against Osama bin Laden will send this very clear signal to extremists all over the world. Extremism has no future. Questions from our audience? Sir. Thank you for visiting Austin, Secretary General. Uh, NATO membership has expanded considerably, especially over the last uh, 15 years or so. Uh, the strategic kind of decision-making has become more of a challenge by adding more members, especially with the constraint of unanimity in a decision-making process. Uh, the strategic concept was supposed to address some of these. I believe that that was one of the issues that they were supposed to look at. But it doesn't seem like any decision 
was made and that was maybe deferred. Can you maybe share some insight in the decision-making process within NATO and the continued impact of that requirement for unanimity despite the increase in members and the divergent viewpoints? Thank you very much. It is indeed a very relevant uh, question, but I also have to, to stress right from the outset uh, that the principle of consensus uh, is what I would call one of the founding principles uh, of uh, our alliance. Uh, we must take into account that when it comes to defense and security policy, nations uh, will uh, preserve uh, their sovereignty. Um, so, they would not be willing uh, to hand over uh, sovereignty uh, to a supranational body. Uh, so, my clear point of departure is we have the principle of consensus as the decision-making principle in NATO and it will remain so. Then, next step could, of course, be to ask, uh, yeah, but uh, isn't it increasingly difficult to achieve consensus uh, as we enlarge uh, NATO? It was founded by 12 nations. Now we have 28 member states, and I can easily uh, envisage further enlargement uh, in, in the future. My experience uh, during my uh, tenure as uh, uh, Secretary General is that it may take some patience uh, to, and, and hard work to achieve consensus, but it is doable. Uh, and uh, I really think all 28 allies uh, try and do their utmost uh, to demonstrate a consensual spirit. They know that the strength of the alliance is very much dependent on our willingness to compromise in our attempts uh, to find a consensus. Because if, decision, if decisions are blocked by then one and then another nation, then it would undermine the strength of our alliance. And I think all 20 allies, 28 allies are very much aware of that. And this is a reason why I have not been faced with insurmountable problems uh, in achieving uh, consensus. On the contrary, we have succeeded in achieving consensus also on very controversial issues uh, during uh, now nearly two years uh, of my tenure as uh, Secretary General. May I add a more personal remark to that? Uh, I, as a Prime Minister of Denmark, I was the leader of a minority government and a coalition government. So first I had to establish consensus within the government, and then we had to um, build up a majority in the parliament. So I'm very much used to that consensus building, and I think uh, that experience uh, have, has been helpful uh, in, in the way uh, I conduct uh, my uh, work uh, as Secretary General uh, of, of NATO. But it takes some pains, patience, uh, I'm not gifted uh, with patience from nature, uh, but uh, a long life in politics uh, has taught me uh, that patience pays. Sir, uh, the uh, Al-Qaeda and, and other extremists, uh, you seem to be finding new safe havens, for example, in Yemen, possibly Somalia, possibly even Pakistan itself. Is NATO looking, uh, considering, or would they consider military action in those other, other countries? No. <laughs> That's a very short answer. Um, uh, our hands are full. Um, uh, but of course I understand uh, your question and, and occasionally I am asked the question, you took action in Libya, why Libya, why not? And then they mention X, Y, Z, a country uh, where we have seen security forces crack down uh, on uh, peaceful demonstrators. And of course, it's a legitimate question. My answer is a pragmatic one. Uh, firstly, we, we don't have the capacity to solve all crises in the world. Secondly, uh, we operate in Libya on the basis of a UN Security Council mandate. And finally, 
uh, we got broad support from the region in favor of, uh, uh, of this operation. And for these reasons, uh, we took action in Libya. Mr. Secretary General, if I may, uh, the one country that people often point to and say, why, why Libya and not uh, this country is Syria. Hmm. What are the distinctions between Libya and Syria, in your view, that makes Syria a prior, or excuse me, Libya a priority and not Syria? Well, again, uh, my pragmatic approach is, um, as regards Libya, we have a clear mandate uh, from the United Nations and a request uh, from the United Nations uh, to uh, implement uh, that mandate. Furthermore, um, we have uh, a request from and support uh, from uh, countries in the region. Sir, in the back. Uh, Alan Cooper, a professor here at the LBJ School. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, you said that NATO in Libya is implementing uh, a UN Security Council resolution. But of course, the UN Security Council resolution authorizes action only to pr protect civilians. And NATO is now doing things such as bombing in the capital, bombing uh, compounds where Gaddafi is thought to be, uh, launched an attack which killed one of Gaddafi's Qaddafi, youngest son and three of his grandchildren. And this is divisive within NATO. In fact, many of the NATO states refuse to take such action. The only thing that they will do is uh, maybe enforce a no-fly zone or do some patrolling, or, uh, but they, will, they would have actually refused to take this sort of offensive action that seems to go beyond the UN Security Council uh, mandate. So my question is, is taking this such divisive action that goes beyond UN resolutions, is that actually good for NATO, or in a sense, are you breaking NATO? Thanks. First, let me stress that we do not target individuals. Um, we are targeting uh, critical military capabilities um, that can be used uh, or are being used uh, to attack uh, civilians. So we conduct our operation in strict conformity uh, with the UN Security Council uh, resolution. Um, so that's, that's my, my first point. Uh, second point, NATO is not divided. On the contrary, um, the decision to, to take action and take full responsibility for the operation um, in Libya is taken by consensus. And as we discussed before, all decisions in NATO are taken by consensus. So NATO could not have taken over this operation unless all 28 allies supported it. So the fact is that it is a united alliance behind this operation. You are right in pointing to the fact that not all allies uh, contribute directly providing assets for the operation, but they participate indirectly through NATO and through our common command structure. All 28 allies are in this together. Um, so uh, the alliance is united. We do not target uh, individuals. We do not go beyond uh, the UN mandate, on the contrary. Uh, we carry out our mission in strict conformity uh, with uh, the UN mandate, but you will also recall that paragraph four in UN Security Council Resolution 1973 mandates to take all necessary measures to protect the civilians, and that's what we're doing. Sir. Thank you. Um, your, your idea of inviting the Taliban into the political process is magnanimous and makes sense, but given that they're against music, against educating women, against a lot of freedoms, where do you get the hope that somebody within the Taliban might be interested in participating in the political process? Um, actually, I think uh, the best way to ensure uh, that the Taliban broadly is tempted to engage in the political process is to keep up a strong military pressure. Um, as soon as the Taliban realizes um, that there's no future 
in fighting. Fighting will lead to their defeat. Then they will also uh, be tempted to engage in a more positive political process. So there is no alternative to continue our determined military operations in Afghanistan. Actually, I do believe uh, that keeping up uh, the military pressure is the best way to facilitate a fruitful political process. That's my first point. Second point, obviously certain conditions must be fulfilled to ensure that a political process uh, will be successful. Firstly, this reconciliation and reintegration process must be led by the Afghans themselves. It can't be imposed uh, from abroad. We can, we can facilitate, we can assist, but um, basically it must be led by the Afghan uh, government and the Afghan authorities. That's first. Second, groups and individuals involved in this reconciliation process must abide by and respect the fundamental principles uh, in, the, in the democratic Afghan constitution. Freedom, individual liberty, democracy, respect for human rights, including, including women's rights. And then, of course, as I have already said, uh, they must uh, cut off links uh, with uh, terror uh, networks. If these conditions are fulfilled, I think we should give it a try. So, like you, I would not be prepared uh, to engage in the political process at the expense uh, of uh, fundamental values uh, and principles, because then people would rightly question, why are we there? Uh, for which purpose have we, be, we been there? Uh, so. Certain conditions must be fulfilled, but if they are fulfilled, I think we should give it a try because there's no military solution solely. We need a political solution. If I might follow, is there any, have you ever got, seen any response from the Taliban that somebody within that organization might be receptive to reconciliation? I think you will see that uh, religious fanatics uh, w will never reconcile. Uh, they're out of reach. Um, but we have seen um, uh, people who have, I would say, been fighting within Taliban, but not for the Taliban. They have been tempted to uh, engage in a reintegration uh, process. Sometimes it's also a question of uh, economics. Uh, and uh, we have provided incentives uh, to engage uh, in such uh, a reintegration process. So I, I think we can make progress. Time for a couple more questions. In the back, sir. Uh, there have been numerous accusations of uh, corruption on the part of Hamid Karzai. What's your opinion on him, on the president moving forward? Um, I have uh, spoken uh, with uh, President Karzai on several uh, occasions uh, on exactly this issue, um, uh, corruption, and by the way, also uh, the fight against uh, drug trafficking. Um, because improved governance uh, is a prerequisite uh, for building trust uh, among the Afghans, building trust, confidence in their own uh, government. And it's my clear impression uh, that President Karzai understands uh, this rationale uh, very well. Uh, and uh, I have uh, no reason to doubt uh, his commitment uh, to a determined fight uh, against uh, corruption uh, and uh, drugs uh, tr production and, uh, and uh, trafficking. Um, uh, I consider uh, President Karzai a reliable uh, partner. He's the elected president uh, of uh, Afghanistan. We also need, uh, we also need uh, his uh, engagement uh, if we are to, to find a political way forward um, uh, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, president Karzai has outlined uh, 
this roadmap uh, to gradually hand over responsibility to the Afghan security forces, hopefully completed by 2014. Uh, and he knows very well uh, that if uh, this uh, transition process is to be a success, then he and his government uh, must also step up the fight against corruption and the uh, drug trade. So I take it for granted uh, that he will stay committed uh, to, to, uh, to, to that fight against corruption and drug trade. We have time for one more question. Uh, Ma'am. Thank you. I enjoyed your presentation. Let me say from the beginning that I'm a pacifist. I don't like war. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for lessons learned, and if you could refresh my memory, taking out these bad guys like the last one, uh, Saddam Hussein, et cetera. It seems to me that there was a bad guy by the name of Slobodan Milosevic, and the NATO troops got him, found him, brought him to the International Court of Justice where he was tried, later he died in prison, and I believe my facts might be right that there were no NATO troops lost in that adventure. That situation turned out right. Isn't that the best way if, if you can do it? Now, the, so refresh my memory. I think I'm correct on that, but would you elaborate a little bit on that situation? But actually, I think it's an excellent example, um, not only of a great uh, NATO success, because it is a success. Uh, the story about the Balkans is a success story. As you know, we have de still deployed um, troops in a NATO-led operation uh, in, in Kosovo, but we have gradually scaled down thanks to an improved security situation uh, in uh, Kosovo. But it's also an excellent example that sometimes, sometimes you need to take military action to achieve peace. I think we are all for peace, I, I can't imagine. <laughs> anyone argue against. Um, so we are all for peace. That's not the question. The question is how to achieve peace, how to keep the peace, and occasionally, occasionally, we have to realize, I would say unfortunately, that we must take military action to achieve peace. And that's exactly what happened in the 90s. Um, President Milosevic um, uh, was the leader of a brutal dictatorship. And we were pretty close to what I would call genocide in Kosovo. So, led by the United States, a number of nations took action uh, uh, in the Balkans with the aim to protect civilians against Milosevic's brutal attacks. So it's very easy to be in favor of peace, but it's a misunderstanding to think that peace is best guaranteed by not taking action. Uh, in, in, the, in this case, I would argue that it would have been not only a failure, but it would have been a disaster for all the values we believe in if we have stood idly by, passively watching a brutal dictator uh, start what I would call genocide. Um, so we took action. It was disputed at that time because there was no explicit UN security mandate, as you will recall. But I think the then President Clinton took that decision, and rightly so, followed by uh, a number of allies and, and partners. And thanks to that initiative, we can today see people in the Balkans enjoy uh, freedom, peace, increasingly also prosperity, and I hope to see all the countries in the Western Balkans integrated in our Euro-Atlantic structures, NATO and the European Union, uh, in, the coming, in the coming years. So I'm pleased you raised this because it is really a success story and a clear demonstration that in order to 
um, create peace and secure peace, we must occasionally take military action. Uh, I would not exclude that we uh, suffered uh, casualties, but you are right in stating that uh, it, it was not, uh, I would say, uh, we, we, we didn't suffer many uh, casualties, but I don't remember uh, whether uh, there were uh, casualties. Um, but um, uh, you mentioned the peace, and this is the reason why I, I want to stress this uh, very important point, uh, that sometimes, uh, in order to uh, ensure peace, you must, unfortunately, be prepared for war as well. Well, Mr. Secretary General, I know my audience joins me in thanking you not only for being here today, but for all that you're doing to foster peace uh, and freedom across the world. Thank you so much.